the result, the full scale invasion, you know, greatly re-energized the Chechen resistance. Uh, obviously, Chechens have been fighting in Ukraine uh, since 2014. Um, but with the resumption of this level of intensity of a conflict, it reinvigorated resistance and led many more to start trying to get to Ukraine basically as best as they could. Um, Ah, there we go. So the way that this conflict has now changed how Chechens are framing the war in Ukraine is that it's a new, and I put this in quotes because they have been there already since 2014, but at the same time, it is once again being viewed in a new degree of intensity as another theater to fight against Russia. The other major shift in the narrative has been that Ukrainian victory is now very much being framed as the first step towards freeing Chechnya. And so that is this bottom line uh, objective that really is this motivating factor uh, for Chechen involvement. So one of the perspectives, uh, this is just one by Zumsu Ameyev, who is the deputy commander of one of the battalions. Um, but it has basically been reiterated by other unit leadership, um, is that Ukraine is a staging ground for the guards of Ichkeria, that Ukraine is where they're assembling, essentially, a Chechen independence army. Um, so like I said, so, you know, as many have said, this started in 2014, but the ranks have greatly swelled since February 2022. Um, the numbers are a very closely guarded secret. I th think the only public comment I have seen is one estimate of 300. Um, I've tried to get answers from different commanders um, and that has not worked. Um, so the other important fact is that recruits go through at least two screenings, one by Ukrainian intelligence and then one by the Chechens themselves internally. Um, and basically to try to ensure that they are getting actually committed fighters. Um, there have been some changes in terms of the level of experience required. Uh, it used to be that they would only take veteran fighters, uh, but now due to the number of units, there are some ways to get around that now uh, for, so for some fighters. So there are five well-known, at least well-known publicly. Um, there are a, one or two other units that there's virtually no information about publicly. Um, and so for that reason, I've left them off here. Um, the two original groups are the Johar Dudayev Battalion and the Sheikh Mansour Battalion. Uh, the Johar Dudayev Battalion has transitioned from a volunteer battalion into part of the Foreign Legion. Um, it has grown in size. It is no longer just a Chechen unit. It now in involves Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars. Um, and they have a diversionary reconnaissance group, the Adam Group, um, which has been in the at the very front line in many cases. Uh, the Sheikh Mansour Battalion was a volunteer battalion, remains a volunteer battalion. Um, they were still in negotiations with the Ukrainian government as to securing its uh, guarantees for their fighters as of the beginning of the war, and they did not issue any other comments since. Um, and so part of that stems from they have had some shaky relationships with the Ukrainian government. Uh, they disarmed in 2019 and in 2021. Some of their fighters were placed under sanctions. One of the main new groups that has emerged is the Ichkarian Armed Forces under Ahmed Zakayev. Um, and so the original unit of that one is the Separate Special Purpose Battalion, or OBAN. And then more recently, you've had the Department of Military Intelligence, uh, which also has a BORS unit. There's some weird distinction that has not fully been uh, elaborated upon publicly. This is led by uh, Rustam Ijiev, who is the Deputy Commander and Chief of the Ichkarian Armed Forces. Uh, Rustam Ijiev is better known by his nom de guerre, uh, Abdul Hakim Shashani. He's the former Emir of Ajnad al Kafkaz, uh, which fought in Syria for many years. Um, so he arrived in Ukraine in October, uh, and this was a big, this was a big event because he is one of the most veteran commanders um, still in the field, and so his arrival 
is not just a military achievement that he that they were able to move him over, um, but also a major symbolic victory um, and definitely has drawn a lot of ire and attention both from the authorities in Chechnya and the authorities in Moscow. The final two units, there is virtually no public information about to the point that even their Wikipedia pages are about to be deleted uh, because of the lack of information. So you have the Hamzat Goliath Battalion and then the 34th Assault Battalion, which is the only one that is actually a part of the regular Ukrainian military rather than the Foreign Legion. So where we have seen these groups in action, and uh, Jean-Francois mentioned it earlier, it, is very diff it has been difficult to verify in real time where they are. Um, so starting from the defense of Kiev, there were rumors in the opening months that they were there, uh, especially the Johar Dudaev Battalion, but there was no real confirmation until September of last year. And so they participate, you can track them though, through the different posts that they've made since, um, as they slowly moved across the front across uh, over the past year, year and a half, um, from the defense of Kiev over into Kharkiv Oblast, um, participating with the, in the liberation of Izium, and then moving over to Bakhmut at the beginning of this year. They've also been used to conduct special missions. Uh, in mid-July of this year, the Department for Military Intelligence conducted a raid into Belgorod Oblast, um, and this is actually led by Rustam uh, You can see him in the front of that picture with his fist raised. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, that would help, wouldn't it? No. Not sure. There we go. Sorry, no. A couple slides behind there, aren't I? There. Okay. Sorry about that. So the particular fact about Belgorod raid is that it actually drew a shift in the uh, deployments of, well, the Kadyrovsi specifically, so the Chechen security services deployed in Ukraine actually had been, they had been in Belgorod um, in the wake of a previous raid uh, conducted by the Russian Volunteer Corps. And then they had started to move back into Ukraine. And then in the wake of the Chechen raid, returned to Belgorod Oblast. Um, the other important part about this raid is that this was actually, uh, their movement into Russia was facilitated by uh, the Ukrainian Special Forces, uh, the Shaman Group, uh, which has been very secretive, but has been conducting very high, uh, very important missions deep inside of Russia. Um, and then the final part of this is that there is this psychological uh, or informational warfare around this. Um, Abdul Hakim Shashani Rustam Ajiyev has played a significantly large role just as his own on his own um, in terms of publications by Ukraine Defense Ministry or uh, or military intelligence um, because he serves as this focal point uh, for Russian not quite hatred but he is an example that the Rus that the Chechens continue to resist Russia and will fall basically will follow Russia wherever it tries to fight. And so he's moved from being a commander during the Second Chechen War to a commander in Syria and now to a commander in Ukraine. And so there is this aspect of he simply, the Russians cannot get him yet. Um, and that is not for a lack of trying. So this has a variety of implications, this Chechen presence and how it has grown beyond just Ukraine. And the most, oh, there we go. So the most immediate one is as there continue to be questions of manpower, it, sir, it, you know, it indicates what is very, a potential pool of recruits. Um, not just, so obviously among Chechens themselves, but there are other foreign fighter units from the North Caucasus engaged in other conflicts. One of those is the Sham detachment of the English Liberation Army, uh, which is in Syria. 
they are currently uh, reported to be aligned with Hayat uh, Tabir al-Sham, uh, which is a terrorist organization. So it's one of those questions where how are different levels of acceptability going to be balanced in terms of potentially bringing in fighters that would be very willing to fight against Russia and they're you know, able-bodied and capable, but they are also polarizing in terms of their associations. Um, there have been attempts by the Sheikh Mansour Battalion primarily uh, to provoke domestic insurgency inside of Chechnya uh, and the rest of the North Caucasus. Um, this started last summer. Uh, there were a series of mostly informational warfare videos. There have been no actually connected attacks. Um, however, after the initial announcement, Kadyrov did respond by uh, ordering his uh, local National Guard and Interior Ministry units to start stand on high alert and start preparing for a renewed insurgency, which indicates that this is a very real concern for Kadyrov, even if it is not necessarily an immediately viable possibility. The final point is bring is you know the path of return for the foreign fighters that are in Ukraine just do not currently exist. Um, in order to return to Chet, turn, return the fight to Chechnya, you would either have to go through Georgia, go th across from Russia, or try to go into Dagestan via Azerbaijan, none of which is viable. The Georgian government since 2012 has been very antagonistic towards North, Cauc North Caucasus natives um, and is not going to let armed militants go across their borders after some past experiences that they have had, um, both in terms of spillover violence from the First and Second Chechen Wars, and also due to their own attempted use of North Caucasus militants, such as uh, in 2014. In terms of crossing Russia, the Wagner March on Moscow, or partial march on Moscow over the summer, raised hopes that that could be a possibility. But realistically, Wagner was allowed to march as far as they did. They were under surveillance and a column, a, a, a column of armed Chechens is not going to be allowed to get as far as Wagner did. So it, there's no clear path of return at the moment. Um, opening a second front has been something that has been occasionally raised by the authorities in Kyiv. Um, not usually in reference to the North Caucasus. It has been raised on occasion in the context of Georgia. Um, so in terms of an attempt to actually facilitate return on the part of Ukraine, you would have to likely see either, you know, changes in man and what their manpower requirements are um, in terms of either needing more, in which case trying to grab fighter, grab uh, expanding their recruitment among different groups, both uh, North Caucasus diaspora in Europe, or pulling from already existing armed groups in Syria, um, or if they got to a place where they would actually feel comfortable sparing some, where they thought the cost benefit analysis was worth it to go and try to open a second front due to the status of battle, then that would be a case. Um, the other wild card in here would be if some if the status of Crimea were to change, uh, obviously Ukraine has been you know, has launched multiple landing parties there, which is not currently very likely of a big status change, but because of the geographic position of Crimea, that would change accessibility into the North Caucasus. Um, so to summarize here, we have seen a great shift in terms of the ideas of foreign fighters, but for from Chechnya and the North Caucasus in terms of what the war in Ukraine means and what it's stand and what they hope to achieve from victory in Ukraine, but how they plan on returning it home and actually transforming a Ukrainian victory into something more uh, more tangible for themselves uh, is just currently not clear. Uh, my presentation is a nice follow-up of um, Harold's presentation and uh, it aligns with the most of presentation that um, 
have been in the morning panels, uh, just go a little bit deeper into details, uh, which I'm happy to do. So um, I'm also happy to see um, representative of each carrier here who uh, will correct me whenever I'm wrong with my <laughs> um, details and maybe some assumptions. So um, I will start with um, So I will start with um, historical uh, context. I'm not going to bother you talking about 1,000 years of history, just like last 20 years that start actually a political movement of Chechnya from exile, if you want, or from abroad. So Chechen politicians uh, during the first uh, war in Chechnya in 1994, 1996 were pretty much um, contained within uh, the Republic. Johar Dudaev, back then, in, uh, the first president of um, Chechen Republic, uh, made it clear that he does not tolerate any uh, movement to abroad and work from there. So everyone's supposed to be on the ground. And uh, he pretty much made it um, happen. Uh, whereas the situation changed uh, with the beginning of the second war in Chechnya in 1999. Uh, and um, Back then, uh, I still was in Lithuania, and I remember uh, the visit of um, several Chechen members of, uh, of Chechen parliament uh, who were sent with a mission to bring the truth out to the world. Because at that point, uh, Chechnya didn't have um, the access to the world media uh, differently than from the first war in Chechnya, when, um, when um, foreign correspondents um, could, could actually come to the battlefield and uh, report from, from the both sides. So uh, that was one of the missions and then it accrued. So many of Chechen politicians actually moved um, to, to the Western countries, to Turkey, to some of them re reached even uh, the United States and um, Canada. But the point is that once outside they uh, started and because of the lack of communication with, uh, with the actual um, ground, they started creating their um, own institutions, if you want, or um, organizations that, that uh, were not always in, um, in line with the constitution that was, um, uh, that was adopted in uh, 1992 by, by de facto independent Chechnya back then. And in the spectrum of Chechen politics in exile, we, we could see many of such institutions that basically compete in between each other for the first place, uh, for who are actual representative of um, the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria on the ground. And um, the most legitimate um, institution that was moved outside at the beginning was um, actually Chechen parliament. So there were around maybe one third of Chechen uh, members of parliament back then in, uh, in Europe. Some of them moved, moved back to Chechnya at some point. Some of them um, perished in Chechnya during the war. So um, anyway, so there were around 20 politicians uh, back then and they kind of tried to um, to do the politics uh, from from abroad and and uh, in order to be efficient uh, they try to organize so one of the organization that's probably one of the most credible and uh, probably most uh, known in in the west is um, government um, of Ichkere in exile which is led by uh, Ahmed Zakayev but at the same time it um, it competes with other. It has. It was created by the um, loyal to uh, Zakayev and, um, in friendly terms, uh, parliamentarians, uh, members of the parliament. And uh, there were some others who were opposing this initiative, saying that it is not constitutional, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have a different um, organization here, which is called um, Presidium of the Government. Um, I don't know exactly what does it mean, uh, but uh, when uh, we talk about Chechen government and exile, you pretty much can imagine what it what it is. Government that operates from exile, right? 
Uh, whereas what is Presidium, it was something new, um, like completely new to the uh, Chechen political structures. And um, this was one of the most competing um, organizations uh, with uh, the Kaya's government in exile. And then in the political spectrum, we have also, um, they came, became um, active a little bit later, human rights activists, uh, some of them were um, abducted and tortured in Chechnya, and then they um, managed to survive, moved to the West and started these um, NGOs. Uh, there are a lot of bloggers who also became active, especially in last years, like within five last years, more or less, maybe a little bit uh, early. Uh, the, you can see upsurge of um, Chechen bloggers um, and their activity in the West. And um, there are some other also new movements, new political movements and new um, NGO movements uh, in exile that are kind of partly new to politics at the same time they're old um, in terms of that they they still have relations to um, and connection to, to the Chechen Republic of Echkeria. So a little bit more about um, them. It's um, it's a uh, you probably cannot see anything there, uh, but uh, if you want, I can share uh, the slides with you. It's uh, fine. So on the picture here is um, Ahmed Zakayev, the leader of, um, of um, Chechen government in exile. And the Zakayev being an experienced politician and, um, and um, with good oratorial skills and, uh, and political analysis, Person, he created several other uh, affiliated structures that uh, supposed to help him to um, to consolidate power in his hands and to make them him uh, one of the most um, credible, probably the most credible um, politicians. And um, later on, uh, not long ago, um, another politician. Um, raised, he, um, his name is Jambulat Sulaymanov, and uh, he, he created a structure that also, besides the presidium that I mentioned um, on, before on the previous slide, he created another structure that also aimed to, to take over from the Kaif. And um, that didn't happen. Uh, at the beginning, uh, Sulaymanov tried to be the power that unites all other Chechens that are dispersed in, uh, in different um, organizations that fight each other sometimes for the, for the political um, um, primacy. But uh, it didn't happen. And um, so Suleimano just go ahead, um, went, went ahead and he, he is um, doing his kind of own politics, competing with uh, Zakaev. There are some other movements that are um, NGOs movements that are human rights defenders uh, movements. So, for example, people movements. Adat Adat means um, custom in Chechen language, not only in Chechen, in some other languages too. And uh, it is led by Ibrahim Yangulbaev. His family was abducted in Russia at a certain point by Kadyrov forces and brought to Chechnya. And um, since then, um, I think they're still in jail. So. Um, this is one of the opposition organization which is not affiliated with uh, the Kaif's government. So is uh, Jam Jambulat Suleimanov's um, organization is not affiliated either. And uh, there are some uh, more organizations. I, I will not go through them. Just to reiterate in order not to um, consume all the time talking about this political inner political fight uh, within the Chechen organizations in, um, in abroad. Uh, so again, to my assessment, the most credible is Zakaev's organization and uh, the most probably possible rival for Zakaev is uh, Suleimanov. Others are kind of respected bloggers, uh, but they do not have much of political credibility. Moving on, um, so the main um, topic of how, um, of, of my presentation today, how um, 
politics, Chechen politics in exile is related um, to, to war in Ukraine. And here, Harold uh, already presented the battalions that operate on um, the Ukraine ground. There are some details that I wanted to add to this. So the first two battalions that were mentioned here are uh, named after uh, Sheikh Mansour, um, the hero of um, Chechen hero of um, 18th century, and um, Jahar Dudayev, the first president of independent Chechnya. So they uh, they were funded by the organization Free Caucasus, which um, which was based in Denmark. And this organization was actually led by um, the first leader of um, of um, Sheikh Mansur Battalion, no, Jahar Dudayev Battalion, um, Issa Munayev, who was the uh, general during the Second War um, in Chechnya. And the other guy who, um, who was with him on the picture, he is known as um, Mansur Chiberlovsky. Um, I don't remember right now from the top of my head his um, name, surname. But uh, yeah, in, uh, in the media, you can definitely find him by, by his nom de guerre. And, um, and uh, later on, this um, battalion first was um, Jafar Dudayev battalion, right? So they split into two battalions. And um, Amir Mansur uh, became the leader of, um, of Sheikh Mansur battalion. And uh, then uh, with the beginning of full-scale invasion in Ukraine, other battalions appeared. And here also, before I move there, there was an important point uh, made by um, Jeff in his presentation, talking about um, that some of the fighters, uh, Chechen fighters who came to uh, Ukraine, they were uh, given away to Russia at some point um, for whatever reasons, uh, political reasons. Yet. Uh, both battalions remained on the ground uh, despite this, and uh, they were will willing to fight uh, further. And with the beginning of uh, war in uh, Ukraine, full-scale uh, invasion, um, several more groups appeared. In, um, and again, Harold talked about them, so it was not actually Mad Dogs, but Mad Pak, that is uh, named uh, one of these battalions who, who is integrated in U Ukrainian armed forces. And uh, interestingly enough, it is, it kind of um, reminds you um, this Tarantino movie, Reservoir Dogs, right? So something like that. And plus also another Tarantino movie with, um, with um, Brad Pitt starring in it. I don't remember the name right now, like Inglorious Bastards, that's, that's the one. So, um, so it was kind of a name given to my mind, uh, was the purpose of propaganda. If you look at um, other battalions, other than um, named after uh, Chechen heroes, uh, so they all are kind of inflicting fear to the um, to the opponent. So let's say Obon, the, it's a special purposes battalion. So if you think about special purposes battalion, they're supposed to be like superhumans, right? So um, you don't want to face them on the battleground. So that's, that's, I guess, the purpose of all these names that um, are going on. So you have um, Gilaev's battalion, and Gilaev was uh, also a big um, name during the Chechen war, like the person who, who was fearsome, uh, and the Russians feared him a lot. Um, whereas um, Johar Dudayev's battalion, Sheikh Mansur battalion, is more or other historic uh, connections. So out of all these special groups and special purpose battalions and everything, um, again, back to previous pre presentations, there are not uh, many fighters within them and they are not uh, exclusively Chechen battalions. So we do not have uh, real numbers uh, on that. Uh, my estimate, it would probably, yeah, several hundred uh, people, maybe less than 1000, but um, it can be more, it can be less. Um, I don't know. So, but pretty much all people who were willing to fight uh, Russia, um, they they are uh, in the Ukraine now. And out of all these battalions, the only battalion that has a clear political agenda is um, is um, Obon, the Special Purpose uh, Battalion, which is which was formed by um, 
by Zakaev. And the uh, way it was formed, like with the beginning of the war, a lot of Chechen volunteers started flowing to Ukraine just because they felt like this. And this became uncontrolled and this became also um, a little bit dangerous uh, to Chechen combatants, if you want, in terms of um, politics. So back to the um, Ukraine's position that sometimes would be like um, treating them not very welcoming and giving them away to Russia. So what Zakaev did later on, and it was the war started in uh, at the end of the February and uh, Zakaev moved on and um, started creation and political moves around May. So uh, what happened, he kind of tried to make deal with uh, Ukrainian government in order to protect these people and who would, who would um, be more legal on the Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine soil. And, um, and this was also advertised as the recreation of each carrier forces and, um, and the aspiration to liberate uh, Chechnya. Whereas all other uh, fighting forces of Chechnya in Ukraine also have this idea of liberating Chechnya, but they do not um, go with uh, the kind of political agenda. They want to be rather independent from, from it and a little bit away. So um, yeah, here um, I wanted to emphasize some, um, some connections that um, early mentioned politicians have with, um, with uh, Ukraine and not only so we have um, Suleimanov here on the picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, and um, he has connections uh, with European Parliament and with Ukrainian Rada. Uh, Zakaev has connections there. He, um, he managed to establish a general consulate in Ukraine. And, uh, and uh, both are moving further trying to promote their political agenda. Uh, interestingly enough, also like back to the um, to the titles of the battalions and different political movements, Jambulat uh, Suleimanov's movement, uh, which is like mostly political, besides also other affiliated organizations, is called um, United Power, Sila, which kind of also very strange um, <laughs> combination, <laughs> I'm finishing here, sorry, of um, United Russia and um, Ahmad Sila, which are like very different slogans, but um, it was probably bad choice of the words. So um, to conclude, yeah, I wanted to just say that um, you have probably the most pronounced um, political agenda of um, Obon Special Pur Purpose Battalion um, created by Zakaev, uh, whereas others do not have such an <coughs> um, established political agenda, and uh, but they probably would be uh, would be willing to move on, uh, but they do not have clear vision what to do. And uh, after Chechnya would be liberated, they do not have uh, ready to go government. They do not have um, uh, aspiration to be politicians as well. They are pretty much fighters. So um, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you, first of all, to Jeff for organizing this uh, great conference and for uh, giving me an opportunity to present here. I'm a little bit of a, an oddity because I am no longer an academic. So I run a research consultancy called Fretologist, uh, and I basically provide a lot of uh, research support services for people working on Russia and Eurasia. Uh, and I specialize in security and foreign policy issues and linking back to my prior academic background, um, a lot of stuff on terrorism and insurgency, private military companies, and semi-state security services, which for the most part means the Kvirovsi in Chechnya. Um, because I'm no longer an academic, I don't have a traditional um, research paper to present to you today. Uh, instead, what I wanted to do is use the opportunity to introduce a couple of resources that I'm developing that I very much hope will be uh, of use to many of you who are working on these particular topics. In brief, those uh, resources are an organizational map of the Chechen security services, 
and in-depth profiles of Russian and Eurasian security actors. So I'm going to explain uh, what those resources are, um, why I'm developing them, and uh, also how it links to the, the broad themes of the conference. So the first, um, first resource I'm developing, um, starting with the Chechen security services, Anyone who has spent any time working on the Kadyrov Sea will be familiar with the problem that I'm about to describe, which is the proliferation of units and the proliferation of units with very, very similar names. So in particular, there are numerous units that are being created continuously, particularly over the last couple of years, that make use of the Akhmat in their name. Akhmat being a reference to the cult of personality that has been built up around the father of the current head of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov. And there's also a proliferation of uses of compass reference points. So Zappa, Seva, Yug, Vostok. Um, and like I say, in recent years, they've been creating more and more units with these particular names with different institutional affiliations. Um, now, keeping track of all of these different units, who they belong to, who they're subordinate to, can be immensely time consuming. Um, but I would argue it matters a great deal. Firstly, because some of these uh, units have been highly active in conflict zones, including what we're talking about primarily today, so Ukraine. Um, it's important in terms of designing responses to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, being able to specify which units are involved and therefore which commanders are involved. And I would also argue that it matters to um, discussions over the future of uh, Chechnya, because particularly over the last couple of months, you've seen in the media a great deal of speculation over the health of Ramzan Kadyrov, what comes after Ramzan Kadyrov, and a key question about that future of Chechnya relates to who are the Kadyrovsi and who will particular units remain loyal to in any kind of transitional arrangement. So the solution that I'm developing is something that is um, at first glance really, really simple and yet takes an extraordinary amount of time to do, which is to produce a basic organizational map of the Chechen security services. So what you see on the screen is just one small snapshot of the myriad units that um, exist. There's a, a large cluster that have been created within um, Roskvadia or the National Guard. Um, more recently, there's been a lot of units created within uh, the Defense Ministry. There are also some, still some units within the Interior Ministry, although a lot of them were siphoned off to create the National Guard and so forth. So the aim of producing this uh, resource is simply to make it easier for, as a quick reference guide, so when you are reading about the Chechen Security Services and you see one of these units referenced, you can quickly work out where they fit on the broad landscape of the uh, security services. Um, because it's amazing how many times in media reporting they forget the crucial information about where does that unit belong, or they refer to it as the Akhmat unit as if there's only one, but then they'll give you some uh, clues to go with it. Over time, I want to develop it into something that's a bit more comprehensive and interactive so that you can actually search for individual commanders, you can work out who's active in, in which particular area. But to start with, it will be kind of a simple organizational map as a reference guide, like I say. Um, the second resource uh, is uh, one, if I'm honest, I'm geekily excited about, um, and that is in-depth profiles of Russian and Eurasian security actors. So starting from the end of the month, basically once I get back from conference travel, um, I will be producing an in-depth profile every single week of a particular security service actor, a security actor, sorry, not necessarily security services. Um, and so that might be an individual or it might be uh, an organization. And what I'll be doing is producing kind of a, a deep dive of the open source information that is available on that particular um, actor trying to explain what their, their role and relevance is within the broader kind of security landscape. Um, 
and really synthesizing all of the information that is uh, available in the public domain. So each profile takes about 15 to 20 hours to produce, um, but the aim is that in producing that, that it will save other people who are working on these particular actors that need access to this information from uh, having to go through all of the same foundational research uh, time and time again, and also uh, being very transparent about kind of where the information is coming from, its reliability, and so forth and so forth. Um, so the profiles aim to be as comprehensive as they can feasibly be made in, the, in um, basically a week's worth of uh, work. Um, for some actors, it will be possible to basically cover everything uh, that is known about an actor in the public domain. Uh, for some who have been basically active for a very, very long period of time and have extended political careers, um, it will be probably more focused on their contemporary role and, and relevance. Uh, the first two profiles I've produced are about 3,000 words in length, just to give you an idea. Um, but they, what they're going to do is they'll follow a standardized template so that it'll be easy to compare different actors. They'll include all sorts of different information from basic biographical information to maps of their individual relationships with other actors within the security landscape. Um, and they'll be designed to be easily navigable. So if you're only interested in one particular piece of information, you can very quickly uh, find what you're looking for. And um, transparency is really uh, important. So you'll be able to see exactly where each piece of information is coming from and where appropriate, what the strength um, or weaknesses of um, kind of confidence levels around the information are. So the first two profiles I've produced are from the wonderful world of Wagner. So it's Andre Troshov and Antonia Lazarev, um, both people who have been mentioned as um, potential successors, for want of a better word, to take over the Prigozhin Empire now that Prigozhin has uh, died in unfortunate circumstances. Um, but what I'll be doing is probably producing these profiles in, in batches because some of the advantage comes from the comparative dimension. So there'll be a batch on Wagner and then there'll be a batch on uh, the Chechen security actors, for example. Now, why am I producing these? Um, Fundamentally, I want to address some of the, the shortcomings that exist within, with relation to um, existing knowledge about a lot of these actors, um, and also shortcomings in efforts to hold security actors accountable for the activities that they're engaged in. So on a basic level, uh, there's often gaps in the information that is known about particular individuals. So let's say you have a, a an individual who's being reported in the media, and there are five crucial pieces of information about that individual. What I often find is that you see the same four pieces of information just repeated and recycled ad nauseum in all of the reporting. And then there's one really crucial piece of information that perhaps is lesser known, perhaps requires going back a bit further in time and so forth, requires a bit more contextual knowledge, and that gets lost in this kind of sea of repetition. Um, and so I want to kind of bring that back onto the, the radar. There's a lot of um, problems around uh, transparency, around uh, where information comes from, how reliable it is, how uh, reliable sources are and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of problem with duplication of efforts. So let's say we're all writing something about Issa Munayev and we all go away and do the same basic research who Issa Munayev was and what his background is and how he ended up in Ukraine and so forth and so forth. So we end up kind of wasting a lot of uh, time and effort because we don't consolidate uh, resources. On a more deeper level, however, um, I'd argue that there are problems related to the quality of information that really impact our ability to properly assess threats and to design responses to them. And so the hope is that by improving the, the quality of information that's available, um, we can address some of that. So one of the themes of the conference, for example, is about evaluating the uh, threat posed by the foreign fighters in the Soviet Union. And this is something we've talked about throughout uh, the conference. But what we've seen in Syria, what we see in Ukraine, is we see sub-state actors, you know, the separatists, the jihadists who are involved, 
but quite often they're directly fighting state or semi-state actors, Chechens, Wagners, the Kadyrovsi, um, and they're directly engaged in conflicts and they are, I would argue, often pursuing kind of conflict narratives that are quite distinct from kind of the meta-narrative of uh, the overarching uh, conflict. And so my argument would be that you, basically you can't understand one actor without understanding what it is that they're, they're opposed to. So you have to have this kind of more um, complete uh, picture. Uh, I've used this concept of uh, displaced conflict before. Uh, others have also used this idea that, you know, what you're seeing is essentially uh, quite often, for example, Chechens fighting Russia in Syria, Chechens fighting Russia in Ukraine, rather than necessarily um, being concerned with the primary uh, narrative of uh, the overarching conflict. Um, another uh, kind of theme of the conference, which was the third kind of strand of the conference, was about uh, how we determine kind of specific policies that can be put forward to address post-conflict challenges. Um, and again, I would say we see problems ar arising in relation to uh, information quality. So, for example, when international responses are designed, you often see sanctions being imposed. Um, but on the one hand, you see a great deal of inconsistency as to who even Western partners are deciding to sanction, particularly once you get past the highest level actors. So everyone sanctions Kadyrov, everyone sanctions Prigozhin. But once you get to the second and definitely the third level, it's hugely inconsistent. So Canada might sanction someone in the UK doesn't, the EU sanctions someone in the US doesn't, and so forth. Even when you look at the information that goes with the sanctions designation, it's alarming how often there are basic factual errors that are included in that designation information. And there's a possibility that it then impacts the ability to impose those sanctions. Because if you hand information to a bank, for example, to seize assets, and you've got the date of birth wrong, that's going to make a difference in kind of the actual implementation of uh, sanctions. But also in terms of thinking of post-conflict responses, um, a number of the security actors, so the semi-state security actors, the Kadyrovsi, um, but also actors like Wagner have been implicated in enormous human rights violations, both in Russia, in Ukraine, in Syria. Um, and whether you're talking about kind of international uh, justice, so, you know, war crimes tribunals and so forth to hold these actors accountable, but also in terms of thinking about Russia's future and if there is a possibility of any form of transitional justice, um, the ability to hold people to account in any court of law often hinges on the ability to demonstrate uh, what is called responsible command or command responsibility. So the, the fact that someone in a hierarchy was in a position to know about and prevent a crime being perpetrated in the first place. What I suspect is that we, I, su I suspect the problem that we will face with a lot of these actors is very similar to the problem that, uh, for example, Italy has faced in its efforts to combat the mafia at those kind of unique periods where there's been a political will to combat the mafia, is that there are a lot of actors that Experts know they're in the mafia. Experts know who they're talking about, but actually proving it in a court of law beyond reasonable doubt is a much higher bar and it becomes much more difficult. So one of my hopes is that we can actually make better use of the information that's already available in the open source domain, because there is a lot of information, um, but also be more clear about what the strengths and weaknesses are of that information that is available. So those are the, the two resources. There'll be the uh, organizational map and then every single week, a profile of a security actor. Um, if you want to receive these, all you have to do is go to my website and then sign up to the newsletter. It's right at the top of the website. Uh, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything. It takes you less than 20 seconds. If you type really, really slowly, it might take you more. But it, it's, the, the aim is for these to be kind of useful to people who are working on the topic. Instead of, a, I mean, you can ask me a question, but I'd also like to ask you all a question, uh, which is, uh, is there any information that you would like to see included in these type of resources? Are there any particular topics 
uh, or questions that you would like to see them addressed. So if you are seeing a profile, for example, of, I don't know, let's take um, Issa Manayev as an example that you would really need to see in there. Um, obviously, I, like I say, I'm aiming for them to be as comprehensive as possible. And also, are there people or organizations that you want to see profiled? And I expect there's quite a few people that have got lists. So you can either uh, do it, tell me now or tell me afterwards, and I will add them to my kind of list of people to produce. Because like I say, every single week, there'll be a new profile. Uh, and that's that. Ah, bonjour, madame, monsieur. C'est avec un grand plaisir que, que j'assiste à cette conférence-là et j'aimerais bien remercier les, les organisateurs de cette conférence-là, surtout Jean-François Rattel. Euh, et puis, euh, voilà, je m'appelle Asset et je représente le gouvernement de la République tchétchène d'Itchkeri. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Jean-François Rattel. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And... Um, and here I am. <laughs> So <clears throat> I will share a small moment from my, from my childhood. I remember the moment when I was a kid, when I was six years old, my father came home and with a shining smile said, finally, Kuzio, we won the war. I could not understand what we, he really meant because I was a child, but it was exactly on um, 12 May 1997 when the Russian president Yeltsin and the, the president of Chechen Republic of Ichkeria Aslan Maschadov signed a peace treaty, and both sides, Russia and Chechnya, concluded that further on, the relations between Russia and Chechnya should be based, uh, uh, should be built in accordance with the norms and principles of the international law. And the, when the, the, the when the, uh, 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 Chechnya and Russia signed this agreement, this was a huge day. This was a huge event in Chechnya because our people and my father was very happy because my people believed that finally the conflict, the centuries year, the centuries old conflict between Russia and Chechnya came to an end. However, the joy of my father and the joy of the Chechen people did not last for a long time because Russia came back in 1999. So today I'm going to talk about today I'm going to talk about the legitimate basis of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria. I will dissolve the Russian myth about a rebel state and present the policy of the Chechen government in exile. Since the start of Russian uh, imperial expansion in North Caucasus, the Russian narrative constantly relegates Chechens to the roles of rebels and Islamists fighting for Islam and for Muslim world against Russia. Yet history shows us that Chechens have been resisting Russian colonial colonialism because of their desire to restore its own forms of national state and to emerge from subjection to the, to the near colonial oppression of totalitarian Putin's regime. Unfortunately, the imperialist narrative towards Chechnya has not changed. Russian propaganda, including Russian liberals, claim that the Chechen state was created as a result from an armed rebellion the epithets unrecognized and uh, rebel are constantly applied to the Chechen Republic. However, historic facts demonstrate that the Chechen people and their lawfully elected leaders restored the Chechen state in full accordance with the international law and the laws of USSR and RSFSR in force at that time. Here are the facts. On, uh, in April 1990, USSR passed two important laws. The first one being on the basis of economic relations of the USSR Union and Autonomous Republics that was passed on April 10, 1990. And the second law that was uh, being on the delimitation of powers between the USSR and constituent members of the Federation that was passed in April 20, uh, uh, on 26 April 1990. These laws, altered the, 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 uh, the, the status of autonomous republics and recognized the right, the right of free self-determination of peoples. The Declaration of State Sovereignty adopted by the Supreme Soviet of the Checheno Ingush Republic on 27 November 1990 was in full conformity with the USSR legislation. Also, the matter of fact is that 
The Chechnya was the first republic in post-Soviet territories to sign an agreement with the leadership of the Russian government on the apportioning of weapons and military property. The agreement was concluded between the government of Johar Dudayev, the first president of the Chechen Republic of Echkeria, and the Minister of Defense of Russian Federation, Pavel Grechov. If Johar Dudayev had really come to power in 1991 after an armed rebellion as claimed by Russian propaganda, there would have been absolutely no question of transferring weapons and military equipment to the government he headed. Therefore, from a legal perspective, the Oh, I'm sorry. Therefore, from a legal perspective, perspective the independent Chechen Republic of Echkeria is a state legitimate, as was the USSR and is today's Russia. That is why we consider the continued presence of Russian troops on the Chechen soil a military occupation. The war in Ukraine unveiled the world to the world the true essence of the Russian Federation. Chechens have been aware of Russia's war techniques for a long time. During Russia's illegal aggression against Chechnya in 1999, 300 Chechen civilians, including 42,000 children, were killed. Five legitimate Chechen presidents were murdered. The entire villages were ruined, infrastructure and economy destroyed, and my father was abducted by the Russian forces. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, the Chechen government in exile has been closely working with Ukrainian, uh, with Ukrainian authorities. In fact, our government firmly stands with the Ukrainian people. Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and Chechen authorities signed a military cooperation agreement which helped the Chechens to revive their national army. And today, five Chechen battalions are, are, are fighting against Russian occupants in Ukraine. The Verkhovna Rada's recognition, official recognition of the occupation of the Chechen territory by Russian Federation in October 2022, 2022 yes, marked a new chapter of cooperation between Chechnya and Ukraine. The friendly relations between Chechnya and Ukraine are strengthened by the opening of the general representation of the Chechen Republic of Echkeria in Kyiv. And this is our main diplomatic office where the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of the Chechen Republic of Echkeria, Ahmed Zakayev, the De Defense Minister of Chechen Republic of Echkeria and other representatives, representatives of the state work on a per permanent basis. Uh, also, Ukraine recognized the passports of, uh, of Chechen Republic of Echkeria and now our citizens can move freely on the soil of, uh, of Ukraine. The Chechen government in exile is looking forward into consolidating the peoples of the North Caucasus. It initiated a new plan to restore the union of peoples of the North Caucasus with the intention to help these peoples to obtain a recognition of the right to self-determination. In November, 2023, the third Congress of Peoples of North Caucasus will be held in European Parliament. Delegates from Chechen, Ingush, Dagestan, and other Caucasian peoples will be present at this Congress. This event will start the process of rest restoring the union of peoples of the North Caucasus. In the current context, the independent and unified North Caucasus and Russia's loss of the Black Sea can help the West to reestablish security in Eastern Europe. The union of peoples of Caucasus will become a valuable ally of the West with human resources equal to 14.8 million people and with territory equal to 50, uh, 258 square kilometers. So the territory of the union of peoples of the North Caucasus will be actually bigger than the territory of today's United Kingdom. The Chechen government in exile is knocking on the doors of the entire international community and is seeking cooperation. We're here and we're open to cooperate in all possible terms. The world should not commit the mistakes of the past. If the international community did not throw the Chechen Republic of Echkeria in the claws of Putin in 1999, 
Today, Ukraine would be a peaceful country and many thousands of innocent civilians in Ukraine and in Chechnya would be alive, including my father. The war in Ukraine is the continuation of the aggressive policy implemented by Russia in Chechnya. War criminals who committed atrocities in Chechnya yesterday are now committing them in Ukraine. Russia needs to realize that the conflict between Chechnya and Russia will never be resolved unless it assumes, unless Russia assumes the responsibility to adhere to the principles that are clearly stated in the peace treaty, which was signed by Yeltsin and Masradov in 1997. The peace treaty concluded in 1997 remains the only document in existence which defines the relationship between Russia and Chechnya. And this document, by the way, is published on the, on the, on the website of the United Nations. Over and above that, liberals must stop spreading propaganda and must admit that the Chechen state is a legitimate state created in conformity with the USSR legislation and in accordance with the norms and principles of the international law. Russian liberals must understand that if they truly want to build a democratic state, they must abandon imperialist ambitions and the policy which is, implies democracy for white Russians and colonialism for non-Russians. As the Prime Minister of Chechen Republic of Ikeri Ahmed Zakayev said, and I'm gonna cite him here, the, the Russian empire cannot exist in a regime of true democracy. No matter how much Russian liber liberals contrive in their desire to establish democracy in Russia and at the same time preserve the empire, this is impossible. There's always a need to sacrifice something, either the empire to establish democracy or democracy to preserve the empire. And I think this is very important. And here in the West, we should truly question the intentions of the liberals, of the Russian liberals who here in the West claim that everything will be okay in Russia the moment Putin is removed from Kremlin, the moment there will be a regime change. The truth is that everything won't be okay unless Russia transforms into a true democracy, into a democratic state which recognizes the, the right of, 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 no, of the peoples, to, the, the, rights to self, the, the, the right to self-determination of the peoples of North Caucasus and lets them go, lets them be free. And finally, although that I am very deceived by the, by the delusion of Russian liberals about my state and although my country is under occupation, I still have a hope and the light of hope continues to shine. Uh, I would like also to thank with all my heart the people of Ukraine and the government of Ukraine for their recognition, support and cooperation. Ukraine has shown an incredible determination and unbreakable spirit of freedom and dignity. I encourage all our Western friends to follow her example and I truly hope that our Western friends won't forget that to give up on Ukraine and on Chechnya, it also means to give up on a true spirit of democracy and on our own values. Thank you very much.